Electricast. Cars say a lot about who we are. It represents freedom for a lot of people. This season on Drive, I'm going to talk to all sorts of different people. I looked at car names. Yes. A- and yes. I found all the car names that have science or astronomically it's inspired. It's crazy. It's huge. It is. Okay, yes, sure. I happen to be CEO of Ford Motor Company. For me, it's all about cars, movement, and our mutual passion for things that get us around. This is Drive, and I'm Jim Farley. This episode is brought to you by Paramount Plus. Ewan McGregor stars as Count Alexander Rostov in A Gentleman in Moscow, the new limited series based on the best selling novel. Stream it on March 29th with the Paramount Plus with Showtime plan. Visit ParamountPlus.com to try it free. Ahoy there. Nick Cage. And don't pretend like you don't know who I am. What do you see? We cut the chit chat a hole. All right, I'm a little tired, a little wired, and I think I deserve a little appreciation. Uh, Shame on you! I lost just a little bit of control there, but now everything's cool. (laughs) Or whatever movies with Wesley and Iris. What up and welcome to Or Whatever Movies. I'm your co-host, Iris. And I'm here with my older brother, Wesley. And today we're discussing a movie from 2003, nearly 20 years ago. The Big Con, starring Tickleus Cage. Tickleus Cage, good one. <laughs> and Iris's girl, Allison Loco Loman. And explain to our listeners why Allison Loman's my girl. I don't know. Why is she your girl? <laughs> because I did Alex in Wonder with Allison Loman. It was this coming-of-age story. Didn't you have to make out with some rando? Yes, I did have to make out with a rando. I was forced to. It was like criminal, what they did to me as a, as not only an extra, but as a PA. Ugh. And that's how you get COVID. I was a... <laughs> Well, I was a production assistant, and they were like, we don't have enough extras in this party scene. So they dressed me up in 70s garb. They (laughs) blocked me in this party scene. And I was like the first shot within this like tracking dolly shot of like debaucherous 70s party lifestyle. And so they put me right next to this dude. And then they, you know, and they positioned the camera and they blocked it all out. And then she was like, action, Iris, kiss that dude. And I was like, what? (laughs) And this random other extra guy just started making out with me. And I was like, on camera, I couldn't like, well, I guess I could have protested and I probably should have in in hindsight. But that's like abusive, right? I don't know. That was a different era, man. That was 2000. That was this pre 9-11 even, let alone pre-COVID. This was pre 9-11 because Alex in Wonder came out in 2001. Man. Drew Ann Rosenberg. I wonder what she's up to. So going all the way back to 2003 for Matchstick Men, where Alice and Loman is a breakout. Obviously, I saw this, but really, I only saw Matchstick Men once, and that was upon its release. Revisiting it for this discussion, I would completely forgotten about Ridley Scott. But I took one look at Alice and Loman, who I knew played the daughter, or who at least I was reminded played the daughter. And I was like, wait, no, she's Iris's age. And so that kind of re, it touched on, it, it shined a flashlight into the darkness of my memory in this movie. And I was like, no, something is off because she's really not that young and she's got her little pigtails or whatever. And so that planted a seed of unease during most of this viewing because I had actually forgotten about the end scene where they make her look her age, I guess, where she has to qualify. Like, I am grown. And you know she's grown because she has streaks in her hair and an absurdly tight-fitting dress. <laughs> and tons of, like, rug store makeup. Like, hey, we're going to the carpet store. Right? Let's put on my, my party makeup. Exactly. If she if you're going to infantilize her or make dress her down to make her look young in the whole movie, if you're going to dress her up to make her look older, she has to be hugely sexualized, right? I guess so. I mean, she's 19 or 20. Yeah. So I guess the point I'm making is that in watching Matchstick Man, I forgot the big con. 
in this movie. Really? So it didn't come back to you? Like until you were, it conned you? Like you didn't realize what was happening until the end? Not really, because like I said, these weird seeds were planted and these tendrils were reaching throughout my body and wrapping themselves around my brain. And then I had my fiance next to me who's like, I don't believe this for a second. And she was like, it's him. How early on? Pretty early on. Like uh, as soon as the kid was introduced and something happened and she, I didn't remember, I don't exactly remember what it was, but she's like, as soon as that happened, I was like, nope, because she never sees her go into that apartment. There's always this weird meeting on the street. And obviously there are multiple levels to this con. And she was like, I can't tell if it's the kid or if it's the partner. And I was like, the partner? What does he have to do with the kid? Oh, so you were in denial or just completely unaware that Sam Rockwell, that Frank and Angela were in cahoots? Yeah, I, I really, I honestly didn't remember. It's half my lifetime ago and I only saw it once. Wow. Interesting. Uh, so I never thought this day would come. You were totally resistant to reviewing Matchstick Men. Why was that? Why? Because we're in the middle of Nicolas Cage month. And we I tried to pick out from Nicolas Cage's vast, remarkably huge and extensive <laughs> body of work, the ones that typified him or best represented him. And Matchstick Men wasn't on that list. Tell me why you decided to watch Matchstick Men and encouraged me to watch it. I don't know. Kind of a formative movie for me. 2003. Well, I guess I was like living in LA and Alison Lohman was on my radar. And this is the movie that put Sam Rockwell on the map for me. I always remembered this for Sam Rockwell and really loving his performance. And then I think he followed up Matchstick Man very shortly after with Moon. Maybe. That was a, another Coppola. That was a Roman Coppola's directorial debut, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, the Coppola connection with Nick Cage. I thought that Nicolas Cage's performance in displaying, in representing a disability, having Tourette's like symptoms seemed fairly accurate. <laughs> of what? <laughs> of who Nicolas Cage is? <laughs> of people who might be suffering with whatever it is that his character is suffering from. And look, I made a joke and obviously I'm a jerk and I'm totally insensitive when I called him Tickleus Cage. But also, he treads a fine line. And to hear him talk in interviews, he's like, I wanted to make sure that it was respectful because I have friends who have OCD and I didn't want to offend anybody. But he's pretty ticky. Like, is it... Very ticky. Yeah, so is it authentic? And obviously he's an actor and maybe today he'd be canceled for portraying someone with disabilities from uh, a disability from which he does not actually suffer. But to see him do it, you're right. In a way, it's kind of Nicolas Cagey of him. <laughs> and that's the line that I want to discuss today. Oh, the, the fine line between Nicolas Cage, the cray cray and and his characters. And it just it seemed to me like Matchstick Men, the movie, which is, of course, the only thing we're focusing on because I have not read the book, was Nicolas Cage wanting to do a fast talking suit wearing con man movie. And then they're like, you know what would make this interesting if he was like had a disability or like a mental thing or he had Tourette's or whatever it is that he is diagnosed with, which is unclear and which maybe isn't real, like whatever he had. According to the doctor, who was ended up being fake, I guess. Yeah. The doctor had no ability to prescribe him, and he called it a placebo. But until he got caught, he was trying to suggest that he was giving him real pills until the character found out. And then the actor playing the doctor, who was part of the long con, was like, oh, yeah, it's a placebo because you're not actually ill. But he was actually ill. It seems like it ironically legitimizes him as a doctor. Because he, like, owns up to it. He, like, fesses up to the fact that it was a placebo. Exactly. <laughs> but what I made up about the placebo was that Roy's disability or what he was manifesting was somehow connected to his guilt or misalignment. He wasn't in harmony with what he was doing. Like, there was this was a way that he was manif his guilt was manifesting itself. Like psychological self-sabotage? Yeah, like that he, in some way, wasn't totally aligned with his line of work. And it was manifesting it in these OCD-like symptoms that Frank may or may not have known were not technically clinical. Yeah. It felt like layers on top of layers. And ultimately, some of the other layers get lost in this giant sheet cake analogy, which is lame. 
his ability to be a con man required him to be in total control. Not only is he putting on a performance, but it's a performance with a subterfuge and he's got it all planned out and has to maintain an illusion and has to go through steps with other people. And, and the, his illness is not conducive to those operations. He keeps them pretty well in check when they're dealing with... At first. Well, when, there's, when they start the Chuck Frechette long con, he has it pretty much pretty well under control. Yeah, no, he definitely starts on top, and then he starts to nosedive when Rabble. his condition gets worse, which in retrospect is because Frank essentially sending him to this other doctor cut him off from his medications by giving him soy supplements. And now that sounds like it feels like Frank orchestrated that, knowing that because Roy wasn't well, he was more susceptible to being conned, to his his being distracted and introducing the doctor character and the daughter character and all this stuff. Yeah, so let's talk a little bit about the timeline here. It's interesting to note that it was when Frank placed the call to Dr. Klein that it triggered my memory that Roy gets conned. It was from that point on that I remembered what I had previously known about this movie, and it really did change my viewing experience. But that aside, when Frank calls Dr. Klein on behalf of Roy, Roy is still unwilling to do the long con on the Chuck character. And so I feel like Frank puts the long con into motion when Roy is, isn't essentially being a great partner to him, right? And then it's after that he agrees to do the long con. So he was forcing him into it in a way because Frank, it seems, is a consummate con man and learns that no one is off limits, Nightmare Alley style. And he's going to go against his mentor because that's what his mentor trained him to do. Yeah. And he's feeling like Roy isn't into it. And if he's going to get out anyway, might as well con him along the way. Yeah. But I think Roy was kind of doomed from the start anyway. He is in control and he, you know, but it's still kind of a small time crook. Like, you know, a few hundred bucks at a time with the lottery scam or whatever. And like, I'm like, is this really worth your time? Get, you know, getting thrown in jail or whatever, if the lady figures it out. But plus he like he lived in Woodland Hills and only losers live in Woodland Hills. <laughs> like, it's like, how is he going to sustain this business long term? The only way you have a nice house in, in, in L.A. is by living in Woodland Hills. But is Woodland Hills really L.A.? Come on. Uh, technically, it's L.A. County. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> but he's a con man doing, you know, a hundred dollar, couple hundred dollar scams and he has a pool. Come on. Yeah, it's true. I don't know how it works, but it works for him. It seems to work. But he's he runs all these cons even on the medication. He can't call his ex-wife. It, it seems like he is holding himself up and Frank sees that weakness in him and realizes he could really be potentially a long long term target for all the money that he's accumulated. Yeah, cuz even though he does have a house, a multi multi bedroom house with a pool, he seems I guess pretty frugal or he's been stashing it away to retire or something. Yeah, it makes me re-question this, which I guess is the intent, right? You can be like, oh, Matchstick Man really made me think. And is Frank uh, completely oblivious or is he deliberately pushing his buttons, testing his boundaries, kind of getting a footing in his mm. house when he goes and, and messes with him on the carpet and stuff and eats the crumbs and junk? It's willfully defiant in retrospect. Yes. And, it, and I wonder how intentional that was in the face of how much can I push Frank and how what can I get away? with that he kind of allows because he's already in the inner circle once Allison Lohman breaches that circle of trust or whatever then she can kind of walk all over him and steal stuff and go through his stuff and piss him off and stay out all night or whatever and push those buttons you know yeah so she you so you're thinking that part of her manipulating him was also testing the boundaries well the whole time <laughs> not remembering what the con was I was just consistently reminded, I was like, oh, kids are terrible. Teenagers in particular are terrible people. And she's going to run all over his, his life is already not a shambles, but it's delicately perched. It's, it's, it's a precarious balance. Mm -hmm. And when he doesn't have his meds, it all very rapidly begins to fall apart. Just because no one else would go through and like twist a dog's head by hugging it doesn't mean a freaking kid wouldn't. And I was waiting for that gun to come into play, right? If the kid discovers a gun, then the gun goes off in Act 3. Yeah, which seems coincidental, but a masterful detail in the, in the drama of the long con. 
you know, you can imagine that Angela and Frank were having their sidebar meetings and she tells them about the gun and the money and the safety deposit box and all that. And they're they're basically building this plane out while they fly it. Hey, it's Kaylee Cuoco for Priceline. Ready to go to your happy place for a happy price? Well, why didn't you say so? Just download the Priceline app right now and save up to 60 percent on hotels. So whether it's Cousin Kevin's Kazoo concert in Kansas City, go Kevin or Becky's Bachelorette Bash in Bermuda. You never have to miss a trip ever again. So download the Priceline app today. Your savings are waiting. Go to your happy place for a happy price. Go to your happy price, Priceline. Life is hard, but finding a really great podcast makes the days go by so much easier. Hi, my name is Blue Toulousma. I'm a writer, an emotional intelligence coach, and the host of Humanize with Blue Toulousma, a podcast where we believe that when you humanize everyone in the room, a great conversation is almost guaranteed. Join us every week here on ElectroCast as me and my guest co-hosts unpack big topics and interview even bigger personalities with a sense of humor and a dash of mischief. If you're looking for a new best friend in your head, we've got you covered. Electric Acid. But did you buy the chemistry, father-daughter chemistry between Roy and Angela? Because they seem to suggest at the end that whatever they had, even if it wasn't as father and daughter, was real. I don't know that the Angela character was meant to be likable. I guess she was. She was meant to be, like, cute and charming and vivacious, and she's changing up his life. And uh, mostly he's just trying to chase after her, keep things in control so she doesn't mess up his system or whatever. So it's, it's hard to tell because I never trusted her for a second, but I didn't remember that she was in on the con. So, I mean, it was fine. I think it was more awkward and creepily removed from, like, the daddy-daughter thing when she was dressed more provocatively and their intimacy, you know, was creepier somehow later on. Like, he, he didn't, I don't think he was going to make a move or anything, but it was weird when she was an adult and they still had this weird familiarity. Like, I expected the boyfriend to be like, wait, what the hell's going on? You know, she never positioned this dude as her dad. And they're like weirdly talking. And she's like, yeah, can you go get my wallet out of the car? And he's like, no problem. And I'm like, really? Like, there are no alarm bells going off in your head whatsoever. Are you talking about the boyfriend? That the boyfriend should have had alarm bells going off? Right. Like, like what they have this weird relationship. What is this about? It's obviously not about carpet. Because they have that exchange. It's like, oh, I'll give you a discount if you pay cash, you know. And it's all awkward. And the boyfriend registers that. And is like, I'm going to leave you two alone and have the, whatever this weird conversation is. I don't know how much he registered it. He seemed a little dense. Um, well, but maybe. But maybe he was... I mean, they they were newly dating. She was obviously unpredictable, right? So I guess this is one of her whims. I'll go get the wallet, sure, whatever. And I think that the creepiness was kind of subdued because he, instead of being like, you look nice or, oh, you look different or something creepy, he says, you always dress like that in this fatherly kind of reprimand way. Yeah, maybe. Like to suggest, I don't think this is inappropriate for a young lady of your age. And so we kind of get past that pretty quickly so that they can start talking. But he is surprisingly forgiving. I guess it comes down to the fact that he, you know, according to his philosophy, he wasn't con. He gave it to her. Right. And really, he did, regardless of what, uh, what his motive might have been, you know, that he gave it to her as his daughter. But that's that was the thing that was kind of most perplexing for me, that he was so forgiving of it, of her, and that whatever it was that they experienced still somehow made an impact on him. I guess maybe he thinks it was for the best because now he's in a better place. And he is, but not financially. He's in a, a pretty crappy place. He's working at a mattress warehouse or whatever. And that, is, I think, is the lesson from Matchstick Men for me. I thought he was, he felt that he was better than that. And so when he's living in his house in Woodland Hills with the pool and wearing his suits every day and has like stacks of cash or whatever, I was like, yeah, I thought you were going to ask me about the chemistry between him and the grocery lady oh. played by Sheila Kelly. Yeah. And I was like, why would Roy be into the grocery lady? Like, sorry, should his standards be higher? Like, why would a rich dude be into the grocery lady? You know what I mean? It wasn't like she, he seemed to have this weird connection. She seemed nice and caring kind of in a way that he was searching for that he didn't get with his ex-wife or 
I guess he eventually found with the daughter, even though she wasn't the daughter. But when he ended up in the mattress thing and with the grocery lady and going to have a kid, that was completely the opposite from his solitary Jack Nicholson in as good as it gets kind of bachelor obsessive compulsive dude thing. Now he's like in like some shabby apartment with this lady that doesn't put on airs and is going to have a baby. And that's where his happiness or his satisfaction comes from. You're still you're talking about Jack Nicholson. Yeah. Well, no, I'm talking about the Nicholas Cage character in this movie. OK. That was kind of like the Jack Nicholson obsessive compulsive bachelor in as good as it gets until he finds love, which is what ultimately his happiness and thus Roy, a.k.a. Nicholas Cage's happiness is in Matchstick Man. He could have chased that old life. He could have chased Frank to the ends of the earth. He could have you know, strong armed her for money that she didn't have. I don't even know if he believed in all honesty that she didn't have any money because she seemed like she was dressed stylishly or whatever. And I don't know that it was worth his while because he found his happiness to, to, you know, shake her down for the money that she may or may not have had. That lifestyle wasn't really of interest to him anymore. But he still felt some affection for her. So he wasn't, I wasn't like, that's unrealistic. You know, when he kind of let her go, so to speak, and she called him dad, which was extra weird. But it was fine because he's a different person. And now I'm realizing he maybe never was exactly that person where he was living the high stakes, high tension life of, you know, he's like, you live for the con. I think Frank said something along those lines, and I don't think he did. Yeah, he was kind of like that guy who he was a normal dude who got into the con game and was good at it. And that's kind of all he knew. That's that's what he seemed like to me. And then Frank gave him this weird gift of, of an out, really, by bringing him essentially to rock bottom. And also through the ruse with the Angela character, he realized that that's what he wanted. He wanted that connection. He wanted to have a family and he loved having a daughter. And so he's still in his, you know, lovely house. And somehow he managed to maintain that. And now he's got the grounded, normal, safe grocery store clerk who's sweet and charming and they've got a bun in the oven and they're going to live a normal life. It seems like this is kind of that lesson, the addiction lesson where you realize, okay, like a normal life that's not glamorous or exciting because all of those other things come with all of the other, the constituent risk and stress that obviously the that Roy couldn't handle, right? That manifested itself in all these weird symptoms. Yeah, this is operating under the assumption that he wasn't actually sick, which in itself does a disservice to people actually suffering from these conditions. Wherein, if he were, if it were a placebo and he was manifesting him in his head, that's kind of crappy. I mean, there's some, there's got to be some that are psychological and some that are more medical. I don't know the right. Term terminology here, but it's very possible that some are psychological. In some instances, but this weird line of Roy's character being extra ticky and extra Nicolas Cagey, I'm not sure where that falls. <laughs> All I know is he told her, you got to be flexible. You got to be ready to roll with anything. And I, and that's like the opposite of who Roy ultimately was. Mm -hmm. He fell apart. And it was weird to see him perform so flawlessly, the, the initial con, the opening con, and then to see him go home and start to do his little door clicky thing, one, two, three. And then eventually it took over his life, probably because he stopped the meds. He had the eye, like he, his right eye or left eye twitch. And yep. then he had the kind of grunting. He obviously had the counting. He had the cleanliness issues. He had the agoraphobia. And then the most interesting manifestation was the little hoop. The little hoop, hoop. <laughs> which I I imagine was really hard for him to kind of keep track of. Like, do you script all of those ticks? I don't think so. Not for Nicolas Cage. I don't think Nicolas Cage is going to stick to the scripted hoops. <laughs> so he just he was just feeling it. And Nicolas Cage doing this kind of shtick felt very Nicolas Cage. And that was one of the concerns I had. You were like, I'm ready to talk about Matchstick Man. And I was like, that's not on the list, A. And B, this felt very much like a Nicolas Cage being a weirdo ticky movie is how I remembered this movie. I remembered that they were con men. I didn't remember exactly the, the long con that was played upon him. But I was like, that's the movie where Nicolas Cage is like chirping and, and freaking out a little bit. And it, it seemed chewy and not offensive, but also just kind of part of his shtick. And of course, Nicolas Cage is ticky and yelly and stuff. That's who he is. But 
the artifice of that performance stuck or what felt like artifice stuck with me if he's not, you know, but this was before people are all like representation or whatever. Now I'm thinking about it in terms of how effective this movie was and how we were kind of conned and how we were conned in such a way that it doesn't feel like a cheat necessarily in the way that I remember it feeling. Because now looking back on it, it's really rounded and carefully constructed, which Nicolas Cage says that he feels his performance was. He worked really hard to be authentic and not over the top. Watching him be obsessive is kind of unpleasant, probably because he's so stressed out <laughs> when people are <laughs> messing with him. But it's it's kind of hard to watch. Like as in it stressed you out? Yeah. Like you, you want him to be in control. You want him to be able to pull off the con because we're definitely on his side, even when he is still a con man. The poor lady in the laundromat that didn't deserve to be duped out of $300 over the lottery ticket. I was still like, he's they're going to get her. You know, why is that? <laughs> Why did you want yeah. to get her? Because he was somehow, what he was suffering with him makes him this kind of weird underdog. I guess, but he was also teaching the kid, all Leon the professional style. And I was like, she's going to get it. She's going to, she did it. And then he's like, <laughs> give it back. And I was like, are you crazy? But we didn't see that. We didn't, like, she could have run up to her crying and like handed her the money and said, I can't do this or something. And she didn't need to give the explanation. The woman got her money back. But we never saw how we never saw how that how that went down because we want to see her succeed in conning her. I guess so. I mean, they want to ensure that we don't hate them, right? Which is why she has to show some remorse, saying, "Oh, now I feel bad. Let's give it back. Like that was fun, but this is all for fun. This isn't for the money. I'm not in it for the money." So, in a way, it helped us not hate her. In a way, it was part of her con, suggesting that it wasn't about money. It was just about learning from her dad and spending time with him. We were on Nicolas Cage's side, but the movie wants us to care about the integrity of Allison and I guess doesn't want that poor lady, uh, the well-intentioned lady at the laundromat to get duped. But when the other dude comes into the picture, we're like, oh, this guy is going to get it, right? <laughs> and you want him to? Kind of. Like you're almost validated when... And then you feel like there's all this at stake, right? Because Frank puts Chuck on the wrong side of the bar. His back isn't to the bar. We knew it was essential. Frank positions them differently just to mess with, with Roy, which is just like so messed up. And so then it's all jeopardized and you feel like it's not going to happen. And then it does. And you're like all relieved. It's a great misdirect because if this was the con that we were expecting and it went down the line, we might have focused on that kind of minutia. But because it looks like Frank screwed it up by sitting them wrong and Roy is like, I can't believe this. It makes it feel so much more legitimate. This little misdirection, like a magician's trick. You know what I mean? We're so focused on the wrongness of that one detail that we yes. don't expect that it's an actual con being per portrayed on Roy. Right. Oh, there's so many parallels between magic and conning. I mean, because that's what <laughs> it's an illusion. It's like the difference between an illusion and a crime. Yeah, you have to say it that way. Illusion. Illusion. <laughs> And then Chuck's T-1000 chase was easily the best part of the movie. <laughs> when he comes slamming into the windshield. Yeah, he's like chasing them on multiple levels of the parking garage. <laughs> and T-1000, you mean the Terminator is after them and they're like reversing through the entire garage yep. in T-2? Yeah. How does he not bust through the little wooden arm of the parking gate he well, it was already he paid he just got out of there at the last minute or whatever yeah i mean if you're being chased by a madman don't you just bust through the gate ah no then you get the cops call you draw all kinds of unnecessary attention plus he had already paid the money and he needed his change do you think she was in on it counting change awfully slow one uh. two <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's hard to know how deep this actually went. It seemed very well orchestrated, especially when you look back on it. Very elaborate, but um, probably not. It's a curious take watching this movie because some part of me knew something was happening. I didn't know if it was her. I didn't know if it was Frank. I never knew if anything she was saying was part of the grift or if it was Frank. And so there was something going on in the background, whereas you came into it better prepared and better loaded. But I wonder if seeing this for the first time, if if I don't remember if I was completely oblivious when the con is revealed, both her and Frank, if you were like, if I was like, what? I don't remember. 
And so it was weird to have these stirrings because I'd never trusted her. And that manifested in I never liked her in this movie. Subconsciously, there was something wrong the whole time. Yeah. Especially since she was supposed to be 14 and I knew that she was your age. But basically, it sounds like you put all your attention into why you were feeling off about her, which probably distracted you from the fact that everyone else was in on the con. Exactly. And because of our prejudices and, and our preconceptions for as moviegoers, you wanted to like the Sam Rockwell character because he was a contemporary of Roy and he was charming and goofy and lovable. And you didn't think that he would do something so willfully deceptive and prey on his partner's weaknesses. Like it was kind of it was hard when he broke up with Frank and you were like, Frank's such a good guy when it ta he takes it so well. He's like, I'm out of here. And he's like, well, Godspeed, buddy. And, you know. Uh, I don't know. I feel because I was already tracking at that point that I, I was like, oh, man, he Frank timed this so that Roy would give Frank Roy's cut in the con. Man, this movie make us jaded. He sh <laughs> he shaked him down. He shook him for everything he could get. And he did it masterfully. What a punk. And he got away with it. I, I feel like this is, was a lesser Nicolas Cage movie. And like most of his movies, when I revisit them, they're either shockingly bad. And I was like, I must have been a child when I liked this movie. Or they're surprisingly <laughs> good. And you remember why he's a star and worthy of his own Nicolas Cage month. I'm glad that you relented and that we were able to discuss Magic Men. I think it's a little under the radar because Ridley Scott, Nick Cage, and Sam Rockwell have all gone on to do so much bigger things. When you think about these stars and these filmmakers, you don't think about Matchstick Men. What is your rating? I found it interesting and compelling. Once Nicolas Cage's, he wasn't just the slick, fast-talking con man who ticks. When it became more immersive and much more a central part of his character, then it stopped annoying me so much. I give it an official all right rating. It's a solid brick in the foundation of Ridley Scott and Sam Rockwell and Nicolas Cage. And maybe a career achievement for your girl, Alison Lohman. Yeah, who went on to do a White Oleander. She did... <sighs> Drag Me to Hell, what? which was arguably her biggest starring, central starring role. But that was Sam Raimi and he mucks up stuff. Well, bricks in the foundation for our filmmakers and perhaps one of the high points for our girl, Alison Lohman. That's our view on Matchstick Man, available on HBO Max. An all right from Wes. A surprising all right from Wes. I, I didn't see that coming. Uh, maybe not wanting to review this was just part of your long con. Yep, the sleight of hand, and then I flip the script on you. <laughs> and all right from Wes, a good from Iris. That's our review on Matchstick Men. Would you also say a brick in the foundation of Nicolas Cage Month here on Or Whatever Movies? An unexpected brick for Nick. If you enjoy this review, please subscribe to our podcast. Please send us a note or whatever movies at gmail.com. Leave us a message, 818-835-0473. We love to hear from you, and we hope you've enjoyed this episode in Nick Cage Month. We'll see you next time. Introducing the Deep Leadership Podcast. Leadership is a people business. That's the philosophy of your podcast host, John Rennie. John Rennie. As a former submarine officer who spent 22 years leading businesses in corporate America before starting his own manufacturing business, he knows that leadership matters. Leadership matters. Deep Leadership is real-world, actionable leadership advice from John and his expert guests. Become a leader worth following. Subscribe today. Electric Acid. Welcome to Sarah Talk Solutions. Ladies and gentlemen, you've tuned into a bit of a different type of show. I'm Sarah B and I'm your host. You can find me on my IG, which is Aussie underscore Sarah underscore LA. I talk about amazing, relevant conversations and topics and what functions that goes on in this magical, wonderful, wonderful city of the City of Angels. My IG, which is Aussie underscore Sarah underscore LA. Electric acid. Electric acid.